Central American countries and authorities still assess the damages and losses after the passage of Tropical Storm Julia. The Russian government has warned that it may implement tougher measures against Kyiv due to the growing interference of the United States and the Western countries in Ukraine. Ugandan authorities have confirmed the death of at least 17 people from Ebola over the last three weeks. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south. I'm your anchor, Gladys Quesada. Now we begin with the news. On Tuesday, Central American nations still assess the damages and losses after Tropical Depression Julia. The passage of Hurricane Julia through Central America left at least 28 people dead, 14 of them in Guatemala, 4 in Honduras, 9 in El Salvador, and thousands of victims throughout the region. According to the U.S. National Hurricane Center, Tropical Storm Julia is forecast to move westward towards the far southwest Gulf of Mexico during the next day or two, as heavy rains are expected over portions of southern Mexico, Belize, and Guatemala during the next couple of days. However, on Tuesday the phenomenon dissipated after it left Guatemala and advanced towards the Gulf of Mexico. In Venezuela, authorities have confirmed that 36 people died and 50 are missing following the landslide occur over the weekend at Las Tejerías town in Santos, Michelena, municipality in the Aragua department. Authorities and rescue teams continue with the search and rescue operations. So far, 300 tons of food have been supplied to the affected area and assistance centers are being supplied with drinking water. In the meantime, the villagers are providing support to the people who have lost their homes and they are also assisting the injured who are waiting to be treated in hospitals. In this context, the president of Venezuela, Nicolás Maduro, expressed in his Twitter account that in the town of Las Tejerías, he has seen the pain, the clamor, the desperation, and their tears. The rest assured that they will rebuild his beautiful region. He will continue with the search for the disappeared. God bless us on this path, said the president. Las Tejerías is not alone. Also on the same note, at uh, the daily press briefing on Beijing, Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Mao Nin confirmed that the Asian giant is willing to provide disaster relief assistance within its capacity to the countries hit by Hurricane Julia in recent days. Venezuela, yes. Colombia, Costa Rica, yes. El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Panama were hit by Hurricane Julia in the recent days, undergoing natural disasters like floods and landslides, and having casualties and property losses. China mourns for the dead and extends sympathy to the bereaved families and the injured. We believe that the governments and people of the countries affected are bound to prevail the disaster and rebuild their homes soon. China is willing to provide disaster relief assistance within its capacity. Now we move on to other topics. On Monday, Mexico's health ministry announced the lifting of the mandatory use of face masks as part of the update of the health safety guidelines to prevent the spread of COVID-19. According to the health portfolio, face masks will not be mandatory in enclosed spaces as long as there is a distance of 1.5 meters between people. However, workplaces with very high exposure to the virus, such as healthcare workers, should wear masks. Also, not vaccinated people or patients suffering from an immune disease are obliged to wear masks, which will continue to be mandatory in means of transportation. So far, the Central American country has reported more than 5.6 
6 million positive cases of COVID-19 since the first positive case was notified on February 28, 2020. And protests continue in Haiti, demanding the resignation of Prime Minister Ariel Henry, this time sparked by the, his request for a foreign military intervention. On Monday, people took to the streets in several cities of Haiti, not only to demand the ouster of the Prime Minister, but also against high fuel prices. Demonstrations were especially intense in the communes of Cid Solel, La Saline, and Termas, located in the capital, Port-au-Prince. And there are reports that in such instances, police used tear gas and live ammunition to repress the crowds, claiming the life of at least one person in the streets of Port-au-Prince. On Tuesday, the General Secretariat of Communication of the Presidency of Ecuador announced the appointment of Guillermo Rodriguez Rodriguez as the new head of the penitentiary system in that country. Rodriguez is a police officer on passive duty who served as Under Secretary of Public Order during the government of President Lenin Moreno and succeeds former General Edmundo Moncayo. This will be the fifth pass reshuffle since President Guillermo Lasso took power in May of 2021. Rodriguez will also inherit a penitentiary crisis that had left 386 inmates dead in the last 24 months. The new director takes office after the two most recent massacres in Ecuador's Cotopaxi and Littoral prisons, where 29 inmates were killed in violent clashes between rival gangs. On Monday, Colombia's Congress ratified the Escazú Agreement in its fourth and final debate, as this is one of the main legal foundations to achieve total peace. The Escazú Agreement establishes provisions for the protection of the rights of environmental defenders in Latin America, the region that reports the highest toll of climate activists. Colombia's Ministry of Environment foresees five routes for the implementation of the agreement, among which are the accompaniment of environmental defenders and an information system on social environmental conflicts. In addition to Colombia, the Escazú Agreement has been ratified by Antigua and Barbuda, Argentina, Bolivia, Ecuador, Guyana, Mexico, Nicaragua, Panama, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia, Uruguay and Chile. We'll take a short break, but first, remember you can now follow us on our TikTok account at Telesur English, in which you will be able to see news in different formats, news updates and more. Other stories coming up, stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. The Russian government has warned that it may implement tougher measures against Kyiv due to the growing interference of the United States and Western countries in Ukraine. The Kremlin Deputy Foreign Minister Sergei Ryabkov labeled as regrettable the incessant large-scale assistance and training of Ukrainian military personnel on the territory of NATO member countries to plan artillery operations. Ryabkov said that relations between the United States and Moscow are now in an extremely poor state, at an only level comparable to the times of the Cold War. Ryabkov also said the attempts made by the West to undermine Russia's economy through sanctions are failing. Now we continue. The Russian armed forces hit Ukraine's military and energy infrastructures with high-precision weapons, as President Vladimir Putin ordered strikes in response to the terrorist attacks. About 200 air and sea-based cruise missiles, as well as several roller munitions, were launched against the targets. During the operation, thermal power stations, substations, and power plants in the eastern, central, and western regions were hit. 
In some areas, water and electricity supplies were completely interrupted. Defense Ministry spokesperson Igor Kinashenkov added that a counteroffensive attempt by the Ukrainian army near the city of Kupiansk, the Zerebets River, and in the Zaporizhia region was hindered. The Russian Federation today have continued a massive air and sea strike with the long-range precision weapons against the Ukrainian military control and energy system facilities. The purpose of the strike has been achieved or the designated facilities have been hit. Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said on Tuesday that Moscow will use nuclear weapons only in the face of an existential threat, as he emphasized President Vladimir Putin's readiness to use all means available to protect the Russian territory. The President repeatedly said that our nuclear doctrine envisages exclusively retaliatory measures intended to prevent the destruction of the Russian Federation as a result of direct nuclear strikes or the use of other weapons that raise a threat on the very existence of the Russian state. The response is exhaustive. I hope that those who speculate on the subject of nuclear war, on the organization of a provocation with the use of weapons of mass destruction by the Russian Federation, I hope they are aware of their responsibility. And the Russian President Vladimir Putin began the talks with the President of the United Arab Emirates, Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, intended to achieve effective political solutions to the crisis in Ukraine. United Arab Emirates Al Bayan government's media report the talks with Moscow in St. Petersburg include bilateral relations and some regional and international issues of mutual interest. The United Arab Emirates foreign ministry said the bilateral talks will address the latest developments related to the crisis in Ukraine in an attempt to de-escalate the military advance and alleviate the humanitarian repercussions of the current armed conflict. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Mao Nin called on relevant parties to properly resolve differences through dialogue and consultation over the Ukraine crisis. We are concerned about the current development of the situation and call on relevant parties to properly resolve differences through dialogue and consultation. China is willing to continue to play a constructive role together with the international community in easing the tensions. And we have more news coming up after a final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back. The French government on Tuesday threatened to forcibly break blockades of refineries and oil depots, which have been paralyzed by striking workers as motorists continue to besiege petrol stations in the hope of filling their tanks. Around a third of France's service stations were still low on, on out of petrol as strike action at energy giant Total Energies and other oil majors enter its third week, and the wage talks stalled. Government ministries and President Emmanuel Macron urged a negotiated solution to the crisis, but on Tuesday, government spokesperson Olivier Viran threatened force to end the blockades which have paralyzed several refineries and oil depots. The petrol crisis came at a time of high energy prices and inflation that are wearing out French households purchasing power. And on Tuesday, about 200 striking employees of the French hard-left CGT Union rallied outside the Fosse Sur and Le Maire refineries near Marseille as a sign they will continue the mobilizations. A minimum increase of 7.5 percent, which would make it possible to cover inflation in 2022 and that to be expected in 2023. And that was just cover inflation. Then we also ask in relation to the astronomical figures that the company made in the first half of the year, up to 409 million for a fair trading of the world, with the value sharing bonus that the government has put in place. 
we are asking for 6,000 euros, which is the maximum that we can ask for it in this contest. And Fabian Kras, the CGT union spokesperson for the total site in Le Maire, points out that workers are fighting for better wages, as well as improved contracts and industrial safety. We are strongly mobilized because we cannot take any more. We are tired. We are tired of the condition to which total expose us in terms of wage, where over the last 10 years they have been able to hike up our wage beyond inflation in terms of hiring because 20 to 25 percent of our employees are provisional workers, temporary workers or people on fixed terms contracts. And on top of that, we are fed up because the tool in terms of industrial safety is not up to what we can expect from an economic player like Total. On Monday, Ugandan authorities have confirmed the death of at least 17 people from Ebola over the last three weeks. The Ugandan Health Ministry reported that seven people had died of Ebola in the last two days, bringing the total number of deaths to 17 since the start of the outbreak last September 20th. The Health Ministry spokesperson said that by October the 9th, the cumulative number of confirmed cases was 48, after registering four new cases in the last 48 hours. The Health Ministry said there are health workers among the infected. On Tuesday, Lesotho's newly formed Party Revolution for Prosperity, the RFP, announced it has formed a coalition government with two other opposition parties. RFP, which won the most seats in last week's election, fell short of an overall majority, so it was urged to form social alliances. Party founder Sam Metankane told a media briefing he had informed and formed an alliance with two other parties, the Alliance of Democrats and the Movement for Economic Change, after securing 56 seats in the election and needing to allure other parties to control Lizotta's 120-member parliament. Formed in March this year, the populist RFP has promised to do away with rampant corruption and focus on economic growth in a country marked by political instability and unreliable politicians. On Tuesday, Lebanon and Israel sealed a historic agreement about the sea border and gas exploitation in the area. After conversations, Lebanon got full rights on the deal, as gas kind of fields will remain in their possession. Meanwhile, Israel will have a license to search for gas in this zone through the Total Energies Company and enjoy the profits. The parts have not disclosed the official signing date for the accords. However, this treaty is historical for both nations, as they have strained relations since the establishment of Israel's state back in 1948. The zone under dispute, the kind of gas fields was unilaterally claimed in 2000 by the Israeli side. As Lebanon denounced, it belonged to their geographical territory, which sparked the tensions. And South Korea's core industry of semiconductor is facing growing challenges as the country's economy has been continuously weakened by diplomating Korean won against the dollar, shrinking ship demands and containing production. The Korean won slid down around 17 percent against the U.S. dollar amid the Federal Reserve's aggressive monetary tightening. The rate even topped the 1,444 won, the mark by the end of September, a record high since March 16 in 2009 when the global financial crisis swirled the world market. Soaring inflation joined with strong dollar are having non-non effects, diminishing consumer demands for major electronic companies that produce televisions, smartphones and computers, which adversely affected the semiconductor industry in Japan. Especially when it comes to emerging countries, in case of a weaker local currency, the consumer economy gets worse and purchasing power gets worse. Sales of Korean mobile phones, TVs and PCs are made through local subsidiaries, 
That means sales revenues are created in local currencies, while raw material payments are settled in dollars. Samsung Electronics and SK Hynix's Q3 earnings report will come out soon, and their sales are set to plummet in the second half of the year. The reason is, as price and demand decrease, sales drop, leading to shrinking profitability. If the current trend continues, SK Hynix may lose money in the first quarter of next year and the NAND division in Samsung Electronics memory business will be in the red for the first quarter of next year. And we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesurienglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media for all the latest news. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Telegram and TikTok. For Telesur English, I'm Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.